Mentone, Alabama. At almost 2,000 feet above sea level, it sits at the highest altitude of any incorporated town in the state. Although the full-time population is less than 400 souls, that number can increase several times over during the colorful fall and spring seasons and when children fill our summer camps. People with second houses here flee the flatlands to temporarily forget the heat back home. You can debate why folks are drawn here until you're blue in the face. Perhaps it's the scenic splendor or the peace and quiet is it the wildlife or dozens of flowering plants, shrubs, and trees that greet us at every turn? How about the cooler summer temperatures or the fact that we enjoy four distinct weather seasons? Maybe it's the friendly people who live here. All these things contribute to the unique nature and attraction of this place called Mentone. But don't forget the river there was always the river. It flows 50 miles across Lookout Mountain, and it gives us everything from flat water here at DeSoto Falls to class five white water in the canyon. People come from all over to see the beauty that it gives us. There's a place I know where the life is slow. It's a mountain top where the river Lookout Mountain is about 95 miles long, stretching from Chattanooga, Tennessee on the north end to Gadsden and Atala, Alabama on the south end. Mentone is about halfway between. It surprises people to learn that millions of years ago, Lookout used to be surrounded by much higher mountains. The top of Lookout and Pigeon Mountain were actually the bottom of a swamp. It was just a broad meandering swamp type plain and uh, to, the, to the east and west of that were much higher mountains. And through time, those mountains, higher mountains have come down and eroded down lower, and now they're lower than the swamp area was. That's why we have swamp fossils on the top of Lookout Mountain. The top of the mountain is sandstone. Underneath is a softer layer of limestone that erodes much faster than the rock above it. The result is one of the greatest concentrations of caves in the United States. This is truly cave country. Mm -hmm. 
It's also what might be called Big Rock Country. Citadel Rocks, right outside Mentone, was a tourist attraction for many years. North of Mentone are Zond and Rock Town. Both of these places feature giant rock formations ideal for climbing and bouldering. Little River is said to be the longest river in the world that flows most of its length on top of a mountain. About 15 miles downstream from Mentone, it forms Little River Canyon. Regarded as the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi River, in places, the canyon is about 600 feet deeper than the surrounding land through which it flows. A combination of factors has produced a delightful variety of plant and animal life on Lookout Mountain and the area around it. We live in the eastern, southeastern deciduous forest, and that's the most diverse in the whole of the United States or the whole of North America. The only place with more diversity is the tropical rainforest. Some also consider this waterfall country. They seem to be everywhere, with our own DeSoto Falls dropping over 100 feet into a pool below. This magnificent country presents a feast for the eyes and tranquility for the soul. Imagine flying over Lookout Mountain 10,000 years ago. From the air, it would appear that our mountain was a wilderness, devoid of human beings or any other signs of civilization. But look closer. The signs of the first people to inhabit the area that would one day become Mentone, Alabama, can be found if you know where to look. First peoples uh, in this region were uh, migratory. Uh, they were big game hunters mostly. They, they subsisted some off some plant life, but they were really following the big game. And uh, they were called Paleo Indians, and we're talking about 10, 12,000 years ago and beyond. The mountain had shelters and game, of course, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of trails, trading trails. Uh, there were shelters on the mountain made of uh, sandstone, sandstone bluff shelters. Um, in, a lot of times seasonally, the Indians would come from the valley during bad weather, they would come to the mountain for the rock shelters and there was a little more protection from the harsh weather. Some of what we think we know of these early Native Americans is myth and speculation. But archaeologists have found spear and arrow points, knife blades, rocks, mortars and pestles to crack nuts, and fire pits. Here, what seems to be a simple pile of rocks, located just four miles from downtown Mentone on Flaherty Road, is, it's believed, much more. The stone circle or prayer pit is, is a unique feature. It's a, it's a rounded area with rock walls, and then outside that, there's smaller circles. Native Americans' stories, myths, and so forth uh, indicate that they had these places that they were very uh, spiritual about, that were places where the, the dead went to the afterlife, and uh, there was a portal that they pass through. For nearly 100 centuries after coming here, these first people lived, worked, and played on the mountain. Their presence is confirmed by the artifacts they left behind, stone tools, weapons, and pottery, such as these at Etowah Indian Mounds in Cartersville, Georgia. In the earliest times, these first peoples thrived by hunting game. They searched for fruits and nuts and berries to sustain them. But Lookout Mountain, in spite of its forests, rivers, and wild game, would have been a challenging place for people to live. Gradually, around a thousand years ago, they stopped their nomadic lifestyle and settled down. Their weapons and tools had improved, and they began growing crops such as beans and pumpkins. Eventually, they became tied to the land. In 1549, Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto began a wandering trek through what would one day become the states of Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas. 
With an army of more than 600 soldiers and 220 horses, he was looking for precious metals like gold and silver, as well as land to colonize for Spain. As Soto's military juggernaut plowed through the southeast, thousands of Native American Indians were slaughtered, taken captive to serve as slaves, or died from European diseases to which they had no resistance. Many fled to the mountains to escape the Spanish onslaught. Some tribes disappeared forever. By the late 1700s, the Cherokee had displaced the Native Americans in Alabama territory who were known by the British as the Creeks. They became dominant in this region, and one of their principal towns was Willstown, today's Fort Payne. The United States government encouraged them to leave the warrior's path, to settle down as farmers, to learn to read and write the English language, adopt Christianity, and in short, to become as white as their white neighbors. And the Cherokee did so very successfully. By the early 1800s, they lived in cabins, farmed the land, attended church and mission schools, and some even built fine plantations and owned slaves. Around 1800, a Cherokee named George Guess, whose Native American name was Sequoia, became interested in the way whites were able to use what he called talking leaves to communicate with one another. For years, while he roamed Lookout Mountain and lived around what would one day become Valley Head and Fort Payne, he slowly developed a syllabary, symbols which represented all the sounds in the Cherokee language. He began teaching others to read and write, and by the 1820s, when the Cherokee built their own capital of New Echota in Georgia, they began publishing a newspaper called The Phoenix, which was printed in both Cherokee and English. Their literacy rate is believed to have been higher than that of their neighboring whites. A recent article in Fort Payne's Times Journal newspaper entitled Talking Stones reports the findings of a team of Cherokee and Euro-American archaeologists who investigated writing on the walls of Manitou Cave. Written in 1828 using Sequoia syllabary, their words refer to ceremonial and spiritual matters the tribe was going through less than a decade before they were forced to leave this area during what became known as the Trail of Tears. In 1813, war broke out between a militant faction of Creek Indians known as Red Sticks and American settlers led by Tennessee General Andrew Jackson. The war's climactic battle was fought in South Alabama at a place known as Horseshoe Bend. It's ironic that the Cherokee fought with Jackson to defeat their fellow Native Americans, the Creeks. About one-third of casualties on the American side were Cherokee. In short, the Cherokee had done everything the federal government had asked them to do, even fighting alongside whites against another group of Native Americans. But there was a big problem. The population of whites in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Alabama territory was growing rapidly. These people wanted new land to farm and settle. Since much of the best land was already either taken or had Cherokee living on it, tensions grew. The state of Georgia enacted laws that made life for the Cherokee increasingly difficult. Pressure to remove them and other Native Americans grew. Then in 1828, gold was discovered in North Georgia. Thousands of white settlers flooded into Cherokee territory. The nation's first gold rush was on. The Cherokee fought back in the United States Supreme Court against harsh state laws which denied them ownership of land. Although they received a favorable ruling, the old Indian fighter, Andrew Jackson, had become president. He ignored the court's action, deeming the Cherokee to be in the way of progress. In 1838, he ordered the United States Army to move in and force the Cherokee and other southeastern Native Americans to leave their land. They were forced to move west to unfamiliar territory in what would one day become Oklahoma. That removal became known as the Trail of Tears. Fort Payne was one of the major assembling points for the Cherokee. The last thing they did before leaving was to elect tribesmen to bury the dead which they expected to have on their trek. They left Fort Payne on foot and in the dead of winter. It's estimated that one quarter of them died from the effects of weather, exhaustion, and disease. However, not all the Cherokee left North Alabama. A few took wives or husbands 
or hid out in isolated places like what is now called Little River Canyon. Even today, it's common to find people in this area of the state who can claim some degree of Cherokee ancestry. Some of our culture calls, called the, the Native American culture savages. And you know, that's, uh, I'm not quite sure who the savages really were. Although they were driven out, the Cherokee left behind ready-made farms and fields. But they left behind other things as well. Their names for rivers, creeks, and towns were often used by the new white arrivals. Traditional Native American crops like corn, tobacco, beans, and squash were quickly adopted by these new settlers. Even before the Cherokee were removed, white settlers had already begun moving onto the mountain around what would one day become Mentone. Since much of the best land in the valleys had already been claimed, new arrivals located to Lookout Mountain. Uh, you, uh, you had some people who lived here in the county, their nearest neighbor may have been two or three, four miles away. I'm not quite sure where I'd want to have lived in that day with the hardness of the area and trying to survive. Especially, you know, since the Indians were still in this area also. Life on Lookout Mountain could be challenging in these early years of white settlement. Most residents farmed. The land was often rocky, hilly, and less fertile than the land in the valleys. Hunting was good in the early days, but by the 1870s, the larger game like deer, turkey, and bear were mostly hunted out. Deer weren't seen around here in big numbers again until the state reintroduced them in the 1940s and 50s. At first, schools and stores were non-existent, but slowly civilization came to the mountain. Few doctors were in the area, so people learned about the healing qualities of the plants around them. Midwives delivered babies, and families were often quite large. The white folks, and he looked back over history, you know, had large, large families. And, I, and, and you would assume that the reason they had large families is to raise their crops to be able to feed themselves. Most families lived on small farms that provided them with the basic needs of life. If you needed something, you made it yourself or went without. The corn and wheat they grew needed to be milled to be useful. At least five grinding mills were located in the area. One, owned by the Crows, was just north of Mentone. The Masons had one near Moon Lake. Another, owned by Mr. Ellison, was about three quarters of a mile above DeSoto Falls. The area around it was known as Ellison's Precinct, the future Mentone. A Mr. Crow had a mill located in the Alpine area, and at Little River Falls, at the start of the canyon, there was another. The oldest surviving house in Mentone was built by Robert John Vernon in about 1864. Today, it's the central part of St. Joseph's on the Mountain Episcopal Church. Other houses had preceded it. In 1854, George O'Rear built the area's first two-story house, which was also the first to have glass windows. In 1861, a civil war erupted over old grievances between the northern and southern parts of the United States. This area of Alabama was spared from most, but not all, of the ravages of war. But in September of 1863, during the lead up to what would become the Battle of Chickamauga, a large contingent of at least 20,000 Union troops camped around Winston Place in Valley Head. They crossed over Lookout Mountain, many coming through what would one day be Mentone. This Union belt buckle was found a few years ago on the grounds of the Mentone Inn. Other items, such as bullets, known as mini balls, have been found along the Little River. Apparently, the men in blue camped near DeSoto Falls, then referred to as Indian Falls. A young Union soldier wrote a diary entry while camped at the falls. It is a cataract or a cascade, sure enough. The stream leaps into a basin 100 feet wide and 150 feet long. It must be 100 feet from the surface above to the water in the basin. We couldn't find bottom anywhere except at the edges. There is a good saw and grist mill on the river belonging to a man named Ellison. Mentone resident Lisa Crow recalls a story about her great-great-grandmother during these war years. 
But she was at home with her kids and she had her one cow and here come a Yankee soldier and decided he's gonna take that cow. And so she beat him with her shovel and buried him in the backyard and went about her day because that's how we handle it in the South. <laughs> During the war, Mentone was the home of Eldridge Jones. It was located about where the berry patch on East River Road is now. Even though his wife's family owned slaves, he refused to take sides in the conflict. One day, a Union soldier was caught stealing fruit from Mr. Jones' trees and was shot by the Confederate Home Guard. The next day, more Union troops showed up to investigate. They dragged Jones from his home and shot him to death. The war had come to Mentone with a vengeance. In 1872, a man from Iowa named John Mason moved with his family to what would become Mentone. He'd been told that the climate of Lookout Mountain and the iron-rich mineral springs located here would be beneficial in giving him relief from an intestinal ailment. So it could be said that these springs, shown here in the early 1900s, are what put Mentone on the map. Today, two of Mentone's three springs still produce clear, cool water. And sure enough, Mason began to enjoy better health. One of his sons, Ed, who had studied surveying in college, had an interest in developing a town. So buying up a large tract of land that started at the brow and stretched to the interior of the mountain, he laid out a grid of streets. This 1889 plat shows the main street was to be Cutler Avenue. What is now Highway 117 would be known as Lake Street. The land between Lake Street and Cutler Avenues was platted and a long narrow lake was built. It stretched from what is now West River Road all the way to about where the post office is now. The old dam can still be seen on West River Road, about 200 yards from where the road starts at Highway 117. Ed Mason was a constant promoter of the area. He submitted articles and advertisements to northern newspapers touting the local charms. One of those ads attracted the attention of Dr. Frank Caldwell, who came here and built the Mentone Springs Hotel in 1884. While the hotel was being constructed, Caldwell boarded with the John Mason family. They talked about the town they hoped to create, and at breakfast one morning, Caldwell asked Mason's daughter Alice to think of a name. She was inspired by a newspaper article which told about a trip by England's Queen Victoria to the seacoast town of Menton, France. Even though she was unclear about how to pronounce the new name, she thought Menton sounded nice. She also thought it meant musical mountain stream. That seemed to fit perfectly, since it was the mineral springs on the side of the mountain, only about 200 feet from the new hotel, that had attracted her father to come here in the first place. Now, complete with a new name, Mentone finally started to grow, even though it wouldn't be officially incorporated by the state of Alabama until 1936. The year of the town's founding, 1884, was an eventful one in the nation. New York's Metropolitan Opera opened, the nation's first college basketball game was played. Future First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was born, and Mark Twain published Huckleberry Finn. For many people who travel by train to Gatlinburg each year in the 1880s and 90s, Mentone proved to be an attractive place to visit. So from virtually the beginning of the town, visitors have been coming here to relax and escape the heat in the rest of the South as well as to experience the extraordinary natural and scenic beauty of this special place. In 1910, a 15-year-old young woman from Birmingham, Edith Orr, wrote a diary entry which chronicled her activities during that summer in Mentone. Her family owned a home here known as the Dormitory. They'd ride the train from Birmingham to Valley Head, then take a wagon up the mountain. In one entry, she described going to the Brow with a boyfriend. Wednesday, September 7th. Vernon wanted to go over to Signal Rock this morning, so we went. It was lovely. The dark blue greens of the distant mountains was so restful. All the same hazy color, except here and there was a shadow of a cloud. And there was the sweet little village of Valley Head. I have looked out at that very scene off and on for nine years yet I can never tire of just sitting there, gazing. 
The heyday of the Minton Springs Hotel was from the 1890s until the 1920s. According to this brochure from 1915, guests could play cricket, billiards, tennis, go bowling, and fish in the river. They danced in the ballroom and listened to brass bands in the gazebo. They took sightseeing trips to Mays Gulf, now known as Little River Canyon, and hiked to Eagle's Nest, the towering rock formation located just a few hundred yards away. Fox hunters were frequent guests, eating hearty breakfasts before heading out for the chase with their hounds. A visitor from Livingston, Alabama, identified only as Miss ECG, submitted an article to her local newspaper extolling the virtues of Minton. Two miles up the mountain above Valley Head may be found the delightful place that I call Skyland, that Uncle Sam designates as Minton. It's a beautiful view to behold, a view so full of nature's own exceeding peace that all our cares seem to drop away from us. I can gather armfuls of wildflowers and fill my baskets with rosy apples. And all day long, in this light, bracing, exhilarating atmosphere, I can feel that mere existence is a blessing. If you'll permit a personal story, my grandmother, Kathleen Stower Shepherd, used to tell us about making a trip from her hometown in Natala to Valley Head by train in 1910 when she was five years old. She remembered coming up the mountain by wagon with her mother and father to here, the Minton Springs Hotel. And she remembered the bright white brand new shoes that she had on and the magic night she spent dancing with her father in the ballroom, which would have been right above us. She never forgot that story. Clearly, a lot of people for a very long time considered the Minton Springs Hotel to be a very special place. Over the years, the old hotel changed hands many times, but by the 1980s, the building was in such a poor state of neglect that it was entirely likely it would soon collapse if something wasn't done. An Atlanta couple, Ray and Sandra Paget were attracted to the old hotel by its charming though dilapidated appearance. They bought it in 1980 after seeing it while on a trip here. As we rounded the bend, the, the hotel just loomed, like loomed up and captured me. And I said, oh my God, what a beautiful uh, Victorian structure. It had kudzu all over the front and it was very derelict building, but I fell in love with it that day. It had 25 roof leaks. The whole back, uh, the whole eastern wing had been torn off. With dedication and a lot of help from local people, the hotel slowly began to be healed. Yeah, I'd come up every weekend and we'd have people helping. It was, it was a huge volunteer effort. It also made it a lot more fun to work when you've got friends of yours out there working. It took 10 years of work to bring the hotel back from the brink. For the next 25 years, it was again the visual symbol of Mentone. Folk musician and Gadsden native Jim Connor played with the Kingston Trio in the late 1960s, and he wrote the classic song, Grandma's Feather Bed. He and his wife, Cynthia, were married in Mentone and held their reception at the hotel. I loved the people and I loved the, uh, coming to Mentone all my life since I was five years old. I was in my 40s when I married her and she was in her, but, um, and she lived here. We got married in Mentone because besides being a beautiful place for a wedding, and at that time the Mentone Springs Hotel was a fabulous place for a reception, it was where, close to where our family and friends were and they were able to join us and it was a very special day. In the early 2000s, under the ownership of Andy Talton and later Jim and Darlene Roch, the old girl underwent a final restoration. It became a magnificent example of what a Victorian era hotel was supposed to look like. Then, in March of 2014, the town experienced one of the greatest losses in its history. Fire broke out, and in less than two hours, in spite of heroic efforts by Mentone's North Lookout Volunteer Fire Department and every other volunteer fire department in DeKalb County, the Mentone Springs Hotel was reduced to nothing but ashes. With the exception of a few stone columns, the once magnificent structure was a total loss. 
The shock of that loss is felt to this day. When we lost it, I mean, it was, it was a huge tragedy. I guess the only saving grace is that the winds were blowing the right way and the fire department kept the rest of the town from burning down. These are among the Mentone families that can claim they were here before the 1900s. Many of the descendants of these families still live here today. It couldn't have been an easy life for these early pioneers. The primary employment for Mentone people was farming. Even today, Mentone has several active farms within the town limits. To earn a living, you did whatever you could. Some cut timber for making railroad ties. Stella Lucy remembered how youngsters years ago sometimes worked as hard as their parents. When my mother was growing up, uh, she was raised there. Her family was just five girls in her family, and she would help her daddy uh, log and even hew cross ties, and they were carried over to Blanche and uh, shipped out on the tag railroad. That was a long time ago. When nearby Fort Payne experienced its boom period around 1890, many area residents found employment in the town's new steel mills and in mines located on Lookout Mountain. Although the town's population grew in the late 1800s, there were few places to purchase things you needed. The railroad through here was not completed until 1870. To Birmingham to probably 1871. So I would think the coming of the railroad uh, influenced people to move into this area, set up what they call mercantile stores, dry goods stores. And, and from there, I think that they really began to grow. Over the decades, the isolation of some parts of Lookout made it easy to establish moonshine stills in the hollers and along the creeks in the deep woods. Gerald Bailey, whose parents ran a Mentone grocery store for 37 years and who is now a town councilman, remembers that even in the 1940s and 50s, cooking up a batch of shine was a common occurrence around here. When I was a kid, we would walk these creeks and fish and just out playing. We might walk up on steel and bend and run us off. We wouldn't go do anything. In the mid-1990s, Bill Adams interviewed a number of older people who grew up in the area between Mentone and Little River Canyon. They remembered the moonshining that went on all over Lookout. Moonshine. Did you, was there much moonshine that went on back up here on the mountain? Down here we're hollering down, you know, on the Little River, down in there where I was raised. Most every holler had a steel. Now, it was when nearby Fort Payne experienced its boom period around 1890, many area residents found employment in the town's new steel mills or in mines located on Lookout Mountain. Gradually, stores began to appear in and around Mentone. There were at least two located by the covered bridge that once spanned the river. The first post office was located in a structure built by Ed Mason, which became Huron Store, near the present Mentone Inn. Mason, who seemed to be everywhere, served as the town's first postmaster from 1888 to 1891. One of our oldest buildings was the Mentone Store, now the Hitching Post. It was originally a long, narrow, single-story building which served many uses over the years. In 1930, a second floor was added, and for years, people gathered there upstairs to dance the night away on a floating floor, which could absorb the shock of dozens of folks dancing in rhythm. It was at one time a cobbler shop, a post office, a drug store complete with a soda fountain, a beauty shop, cloth shop, woodworking shop, and an antique gallery. The stone structure attached to the hitching post originally served as a post office and today it's a gift shop. Feelings of isolation were often a real problem for Mentone area folks. I hated every minute of it back then. I was, I was more or less shut off from everything back over in there, and I was to, at the age that I wanted to be where the action was, whether I was part of the action or not, I wanted to be there. 
and I hate every minute to, to live back in there. Now, I wouldn't mind living back in there and having me a log cabin or anything. But at that age, I was 16 years old when we moved there. The roads on top of Lookout were legendarily awful. This little ditty could often be found scribbled beside some of the pig trots which passed for roads. This road is not passable, not even jackassable, so when you travel, take your own gravel. It took well into the 20th century to overcome the problems of getting around on the mountain and being able to go to other places. We came to Alabama from South Carolina. We had car when we lived in South Carolina. Had good roads there, but when we got to look out mountain, we had to park the car and forget about it till next. So didn't run it much then because the roads were so rough. How often did you uh, go off the mountain to, to Valley Head or to Fort Payne or other places? Fort Payne was a place I had heard of. I never expected in my wildest dreams to ever get that far away from home. But I did go to Valley Head from time to two, but Menton was about the extent of it. Homesteads were simple. Grass in a yard was considered undesirable. Most of the yards at that, back in the early times, was uh, free of grass. We tried to keep the grass out of the yard, and every spring, we'd go into the woods and get to these uh, cut off dogwood limbs that were real limber and make a brush broom out of them. We'd have to sweep off that yard every, every Saturday and get, have it real clean. So. Besides the home, most farms would have had a few other structures. Chicken house, and barn, and hog house, and every little building out in the back, and a half moon on the door. Willie B. Langston told a story about one of the small pleasures of life a hundred years ago. This old man, we have been dead a good while, but he told me, they take that homemade tobacco and when it's damp, you know, get the stem out of it, and big old leaves, you know, get the stem out of it. Take a whole bunch of them and put them together, had a little baseboard box. Put them in now, you know, put them. Put so many leaves in, drink a little sugar, you know, or a little syrup. They had another leaf and do the same way. Lay a piece of wood big enough to go down in that box on that tobacco. Lay a big rock on it, press it down there. They call that the Sunday tobacco. <laughs> They smoke that or chew it? Chew it. Chew it, yeah. That was just Sunday tobacco. Today, there are 12 churches in the immediate Mentone area. Very early on, people in and around Mentone wanted to enhance their spiritual lives. They sought to create places of worship. The earliest were Little River Baptist and Holly Springs Baptist Churches, both established in the 1850s. Joyful, 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 Each spring, several of our churches combine to hold an annual Easter egg drop and festival for the town's children. Hundreds of kids scamper to collect the plastic eggs filled with candy that are dropped by helicopter. Frequently in the early years, churches also substituted as schools. Next to the religion, Mentonians valued education. At least seven tiny schools operated on and off in the late 1880s and early 1900s. The first official school was in a small log house east of Mentone on today's Highway 117. Like the others to come, these simple schools had terms of only three months each year. Uh, school was probably only a three month deal out of the year. And you wouldn't have seen, you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have seen five or six or seven months of schools probably until the late 20s, early 30s. Amelia Kirk Lolly was born in Mentone in the early 1930s. She spent most of her life in San Diego. 
She and her family frequently returned, and she remembers being allowed to sit in on classes at one of the schools when she was just six years old. They had a teacher, and they had a well, and you went out and got your water from the well, and you brought your lunch and so forth, and it was all six grades in one room. One teacher taught everybody. You sat there at your desk, and you listened to the teacher, and you know, you had your inkwell and your pen and paper and that sort of thing. In a 1993 interview, Stella Lucy remembered her time in school on the mountain in the 1930s and the difficulty kids faced just getting there. When we moved out here in 1932, uh, there's no bus rafts, no school bus rafts, and the roads were in bad shape then. I'd finished the eighth grade at Fort Payne and thought that would be all I'd go to school. And then the next year, after we'd been out here a year, the school buses started running. And the roads were in such bad shape then, sometimes we'd go up these red hills, the boys would all have to get out and push the bus over the hill. Uh, the first bus we rode was just a flat truck bed with uh, church benches back to back in the center of it for a short time and then they put, what was that called, Ivan glass they put around it to keep the weather out and it was pretty crooked but. Today, Moon Lake has a student population of less than 90 kids. It has the highest academic rating of any elementary school in DeKalb County and ranks as one of the best in the state. Often referred to as the heartbeat of Mentone, the school has managed to keep its doors open in spite of its small number of students, thanks to the tireless work of parents, teachers, and school principals. The community and the school are one entity. We, we, we work together as a team. Um, you know, people say, what do you need? How can we help? All the time. We never go without, if there's a need and someone finds out in this town, it's provided. The community loves this school, and this school loves the town of Mentone. If it had been for the community, it would probably have been closed. But the community's kept it going. As the 20th century rolled along, Mentone men and women responded to the nation's call to serve in the First World War. Then, the Great Depression of the 1930s forced a halt to a number of development projects like a hotel at Lake Lahusage. A. A. Miller's plans to develop the area around DeSoto Falls were put on hold, and Colonel Milford Howard's scheme to build a resort community at Alpine collapsed. Roads were improving, more effectively connecting Mentone with the rest of the country. The town continued to draw vacationers, sightseers, and second homers. Sometimes these outsiders were a cause of concern to local residents. In 1929, a minister and 21 other permanent residents wrote a letter to the editor of a Fort Payne newspaper. In part, the letter read, we who sign this letter to you live in Mentone and are trying to rear our children free from the vices which now endanger them. Conditions have so changed with the growth of Mentone that if not checked, is certain to affect the lives of our children for evil. We bitterly resent the parading of young men and women on roads and streets, walking and packed in automobiles half naked. Bathing on the mountain has become a moral menace by the extremes to which it is carried. The way in which half naked boys and girls are mixed in the water and sunning on the banks is demoralizing and certain to bring evil to any community which tolerates it. It's difficult to say what, if any, effect this letter had on the behavior of the young people who flocked to Mentone in those days, and since then. When the Second World War began, Mentone's men and women once again responded. The town continued to be a magnet for tourists, who were and are responsible for the creation of many jobs and much of the economic well-being of the town. Visitors have been enchanted by the Mentone area's scenery and its bountiful array of flowering and unusual plants for 130 years. It's a nature lover's delight 
If you don't like the outdoors, and especially the blooming things, then Mentone is not for you. Around 1940, Mrs. Lillian Boyd wrote to her hometown newspaper in Paducah, Kentucky, about the fabulous scenery on the river near her home around Alpine. She said, the entire river is lined with beautiful shrubbery and wildflowers of all kinds, including great banks and clumps of rhododendron, mountain laurel, ferns, and many other blooming plants and shrubs. In the spring and fall, these banks are a perfect riot of color. It is truly the place for the artist who paints nature's beauty, undisturbed. Lush forests, natural features, and interesting structures have intrigued locals and visitors from the beginning. At 104 feet in height, DeSoto Falls was named after the Spanish conquistador who passed near here in the early 1540s. Originally, it was known as Indian Falls. Just two and a half miles down the Little River from Mentone, the falls has attracted nature lovers, swimmers, sightseers, kayakers, and boaters. It's been a part of DeSoto State Park since the 1930s. Just 200 yards away is a rock formation known as the Welch Caves. The approach is narrow and would have allowed for only a single person at a time to reach it. That made it ideal as a place to live, providing a shelter which was easy to defend if need be. When the first white settlers came into the area, they noticed a rock wall lining the edge of the shelf outside the caves. It's a 60-foot drop to the river below. In an attempt to explain a rock wall at the caves, a persistent legend grew up that it had been fortified by Welch explorers led by Prince Maddock around the year 1000. However, there's never been any archaeological evidence whatsoever to support this theory. Eagle's Nest was a popular sightseeing destination, located on the brow just a couple of hundred yards from the old Mentone Springs Hotel. It provided a dizzying view of the valley from its top. It's now on private property. Moon Lake was built by Ed Mason. For many years, from the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, Mason invited Mentonians to visit and enjoy swimming, horse races, and picnics. This horseshoe was found recently on the road around the lake and no doubt is a relic from the days when Moon Lake was enjoyed by the town's citizens. It's now in private hands and was once owned by Martha Berry, the founder of Berry College in Rome, Georgia. Cloudmont Ski Resort. Alabama's only ski slope was built by Jack Jones and his family in the early 1970s. It's the second most southerly ski slope in the United States. The bridge on Highway 117 over the Little River in Mentone was built in the 1920s. It's the last remaining open spandrel bridge in Alabama. A new structure to be completed in 2020 will supersede it. The old bridge will remain for foot traffic. DeSoto State Park, completed in the 1930s, was built during the height of the Great Depression by the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC. It contains more than a dozen federally designated endangered or threatened species of plants and animals. The park's construction provided much needed employment to hundreds of the area's young men at a time when jobs were very hard to find. The park was built using stones from a rock quarry, which is still there in the backwoods. It looks like the young CCC workers just laid down their tools 75 years ago and walked away. These young men also made major improvements to Highway 117 up the mountain from Valley Head. The state park has miles of hiking trails and waterfalls. A dizzying array of Mount Laurel, azaleas, and rhododendron have made this magical place a mecca for nature lovers for more than 70 years. Several of the original log cabins from the 1930s and many newer cabins are available for rental. Howard's Chapel has to be one of the most unique places of worship anywhere. Built into a huge rock, it was a labor of love, and it was the Colonel's last great project. We'll hear more about him in a few minutes. His ashes are contained in a special vault built into the massive boulder inside the church. It's open year-round and remains an active church. 
Little River Canyon, just 15 miles downriver from Mentone, became a national preserve in the 1980s. It attracts adventurers, kayakers, and hikers from all over the world. In places along its 18-mile length, the sides of the canyon rise to more than 600 feet above the water, making it the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi River. The rare and endangered green pitcher plant flourishes here. Waterfalls abound, and a paved road built in the 1950s provides access to a number of overlooks. Built in partnership with Jacksonville State University, a welcome center with several state-of-the-art environmental features provides information about the canyon as well as educational programs. In about 1879, John and Ed Mason donated the materials to build a covered bridge. It was about a mile below what's now Highway 117 and connected east and west river roads. For years, it was the only bridge over the river near Mentone. In 1945, a truck loaded with materials needed to repair the aging structure started across the bridge but never made it to the other side. The bridge collapsed, but you can still see some of its original pylons. Pigeon Pocket. Located just inside Georgia, about 20 miles from Mentone, the pocket's in Macklemore Cove at the foot of the Pigeon Mountain Spur of Lookout Mountain. It has an amazing array of blooming flowers that are somewhat unusual in their abundance. March, April, and May are ideal times to walk on the boardwalk through the park and to see the falls that are a short distance upstream. And if it's plants you crave, it sometimes seems that every square inch of the outdoors here has something growing on it. For a tiny town with a population of under 500 souls, it's surprising how many people with Mentone connections have had a significant impact on the outside world. Let's meet some of them. Mentone was significant in the lives of two United States congressmen, Colonel Milford Howard and Miles Allgood. Allgood was born on a farm in Blount County, Alabama. That agricultural background would prove a boon to both the state and the nation. He served in several capacities in state government, including as agriculture commissioner. His grandson, retired Air Force Colonel David Allgood, talked recently about his grandfather. I believe you probably like to do what you're good at, and at an early age, he was good at it, having started at age six. So I believe so, and and obviously, folks of the day recognized that he was good at it, and he had some ideas that revolutionized and, and elevated our agricultural system in the state and the nation. Allgood served five consecutive terms in Congress, beginning in 1923. That year, he also built a home here. When his time in Congress ended, he moved to Mentone and lived out the rest of his years. Allgood's agricultural background attracted the notice of President Franklin Roosevelt. He invited the congressman to spend some time at the Little White House in Warm Springs, Georgia, briefing Roosevelt on agricultural policy. During that visit, Allgood convinced the president that it was critical that a new government program be created to rejuvenate the impoverished and isolated Tennessee Valley region of Alabama and Tennessee. Allgood worked hard in Congress to make that idea a reality. It resulted in the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority to harness the power of the river to produce electricity and to create an inland waterway for transporting crops and other goods. It became one of the nation's most successful government programs. In 1970, the United States Congress recognized this Mentonian as the individual who did more to promote hydroelectric power in the United States than any other person. Allgood once summed up his concept by saying, I look upon the power of rivers as I do the sunshine, air, and water of the seas and oceans. It is a right that is inherent to our people and should be used for the welfare of all the people and not just the interest of the few. Martha Berry. Born in Alabama in 1865, she became concerned with the desperate poverty and lack of education of people in North Georgia, North Alabama, and South Tennessee. So she decided to do something to help. In the 1890s, she used a playhouse on her family's property near Rome, Georgia, and began teaching Sunday school classes for local children. She opened the Boys Industrial School in 1902 with five boarders. 
In 1909, she created the Berry School for Girls. In exchange for working in various jobs around the school, such as farming, building, cooking, cleaning, weaving, and so forth, the students received an education. It's a model that continues to this day. These schools garnered national attention, and Miss Berry was able to get financial support from such people as automobile magnate Henry Ford. In 1926, she created her most lasting legacy, Berry College, which started as a junior college and became a four-year school a few years later. Today, 2,200 undergraduate students attend classes on a campus that has the largest acreage of any college or university in the world. Theodore Roosevelt once said of her work, this is the greatest practical work for American citizenship done within the last decade. Miss Berry often spent summers in Mentone at a home her family built near downtown. In the late 1930s, she built this log home at Moon Lake. It's believed that Henry Ford was a visitor. Albert Abernathy Miller had an entrepreneur's heart and a developer's mind. He came to Fort Payne from West Virginia, where he'd constructed a number of power generating dams. On his arrival in 1906, he literally got down to business. He owned a Chevrolet dealership and a phone company in Valley Head and a Fort Payne ice plant at that town's first apartment building. In the mid 1920s, he decided that DeSoto Falls would be an ideal place to build a power generating plant using the flow of the Little River which was sometimes referred to in those days as the DeSoto River. Using steel railroad rails as a kind of rebar, he built a concrete dam at the falls. The power it generated went to Mentone, Valley Head, Fort Payne, Collinsville, and Menlo, Georgia. It also raised the level of the river significantly from the dam all the way back to Mentone, creating a lake for fishermen and small boats to use. Although he wasn't an engineer by training, his dam has stood for more than 90 years. Not everyone was excited by the arrival of electricity and the light bulb. In a 1924 article in the DeKalb County Herald, a Valley Head correspondent wrote, Mr. A.A. A. Miller has been around our town and turned on the light, and some of us are tickled to death to see our homes as they are. But on the other hand, some of us can see ourselves as never before. We didn't know our faces and hands and feet were so dirty. We are inclined to want the light turned off. Miller eventually sold his operation to Alabama Power Company, and then the state acquired it and made it part of DeSoto State Park. Many people still come to the dam to fish, boat, swim, and enjoy the scenery. Some will remember this tall, very tall diving platform from the 1950s and 60s. Hal and Nelda Ellis Howe. Nelda was Mentone's first historian. She taught elementary school for many years and married Hal Howell in 1929. She wrote her history of the town in 1980 using family diaries and the recollections of local people as her main sources of information. Hal had arrived in Mentone after his family read an advertisement in their hometown newspaper in Ohio. It read, Fish out the window of your house. In 1922, he bought the Huron Boarding House in Mentone. After it burned in 1927, he rebuilt it the next year and named it DeSoto Lodge. Today, it's the Mentone Inn. This 12-room mini hotel still preserves the original rooms and layout and has changed little since its construction. Jack Jones. It's been said that few people have ever had a greater impact on Mentone than the family of Jack and Olive Jones. In 1929, Olive's Mentone connection began when her father built a cabin here. Jack attended camp at Cloudmont, beginning when he was eight years old. They had a deep love of the area, and in 1947, they bought Cloudmont Camp, where Jack had been both a camper and a counselor. Over the years, the Jones created several businesses, including a shopping village, a girl's ranch, a real estate company, and a golf and ski resort. Colonel Milford Howard. This extraordinary man had vision and big dreams. His biography, Vagabond Dreamer, details his exploits. 
Growing up in poverty in North Georgia, as a young man, he walked to Fort Payne in the late 1800s, where he persuaded a local lawyer to lend him law books. Although he'd had very little schooling, he diligently studied the borrowed books and managed to pass the state bar exam. Lawyers in those days were often referred to as Colonel, which is how he got his title. Over the course of his amazing lifetime, he panned for gold in Alaska, wrote and starred in a successful Hollywood movie called The Bishop of the Ozarks, served two terms as a United States congressman, and wrote best-selling books. He personally laid out the route of the Gadsden to Mentone portion of today's Lookout Mountain Parkway, and was the only person known to have walked the original route on top of the mountain from Gadsden to Chattanooga. Perhaps inspired by Martha Berry's work at her schools in Rome, he created the master school system in the late 1920s to educate area children. Although the project failed for lack of funds after only a few seasons, the ruins of the school on a ridge in the woods and of his nearby cabin can still be seen near Comer Scout Camp. He was a columnist for the Birmingham News and once interviewed Italian strongman Benito Mussolini. He dreamed of developing an area around Alpine, outside Mentone, hoping to create an artist colony. This old plat shows the extent of those dreams, which included streets, a hotel, and a country club. He completed a lodge, now at Alpine Camp, but almost nothing else ever got built except a dam near Alpine that created a small lake on that part of the Little River. His most lasting contribution was the Sally Howard Memorial Church built in 1937 to honor his late wife. And that brings us to Granny Dollar. Nancy Callahan Dollar was born on Sand Mountain sometime in the 1820s. Her mother was Scottish and her father was a full-blooded Cherokee. When the Cherokee removal came in 1838, she and her family hid out in a cave and so were able to stay in Alabama. During the Civil War, she hauled freight to country stores around the Atlanta area and eventually she moved to Alpine. She didn't marry until she was 70 years old. Her husband, Nelson Dollar, died when she was in her 90s, leaving her to eke out a living any way she could. Stella Lucy remembered that as a child, she had a granny encounter. The dog was named Buster, and we were afraid to go close until she took care of the dog. And when we asked to take her picture, she had my mother to she cut her toenails before she could take her picture, so that was something she needed to have done. Colonel Howard knew Granny well. He was responsible for creating much of the legend that grew up around her over the years. She lived on the output of a small vegetable garden, a few skinny chickens, and whatever she could wrangle from neighbors. She also would charge a fee for people to take her picture. Her dog, Buster, a mean-tempered little mongrel, tolerated exactly one person, Granny. Howard wrote a Birmingham News column about her in 1928, describing his first meeting with the old lady. He'd been away visiting in California. When he returned, he found that Granny Dollar had moved herself and Buster into one of his cabins. The story went like this. Colonel Howard wrote, On my return, I had to face the serious problem of feeding and clothing Granny. There was nothing for me to do but to accept the situation, which I did gladly, for I thought if we all starved, Granny might as well go along with the rest of us. At their first meeting, she told Howard, I'm an Injun, and we Injuns don't want to fool nobody, so I thought I'd come and ask you some questions before I decide to live with you all the rest of my life. The Colonel swallowed hard and told her to ask anything she liked. Y'all don't eat meat at the school, but I gotta have a little fat to put in my biscuits and fat meat to boil with my cabbage and turnip greens. The Colonel assured her he would make an exception and make some meat available to her. She beamed. Y'all don't let the boys chaw or smoke, but I just gotta have my backy child. Can I have it? The Colonel somewhat reluctantly assured her she could. A pleased granny decided at that point that she would call him Pa, even though she was over a hundred years old. Now, Pa, I want to ask you to let me keep Buster. He's my dog, and I just can't live without him. It won't take much to feed him, 
Again, the colonel agreed to allow it. And, Pa, I got some chickens I want to bring. Can I bring my chickens? The colonel was a little hesitant, worrying about the safety of the big vegetable garden that he and the master school depended on. But Granny reassured him. Pa, them's Injun chickens. They wouldn't touch cabbage or lettuce or any sort of vegetables, even if they're starving. The colonel knew she had him, so he said she could keep her chickens and asked if there was anything else. But Granny wasn't done yet. And Paul, there's one more thing. I never sat in a rocking chair in my whole life. Won't you give me that rocking chair you're sitting in? I'd rather have it than anything I ever seen in my born days. Helpless to resist at this point, Howard gave her the chair. Granny placed it on her head and walked off. Colonel Howard was grateful the interview was over. Then Granny turned and said, Paul, I just ought to tell you I'm coming to see you every day. Late in life, when she knew she was dying, she mentioned to folks that she'd saved up $23 for her gravestone. But someone broke into her cabin and stole the money, and her grave wasn't marked until many years later. When she died in 1931, Colonel Howard signed her death certificate. But curiously, it didn't have her name on it. She was believed to be somewhere between 103 and 110 at the time of her death. Mentone had lost a legend. Many other folks have had their moments on the larger stage beyond Mentone. William Terry Battam began his military aviation career in World War I, serving as a gunner in first the French Air Corps and then joining the United States Army Air Corps when this country entered the war. He became an ace as a gunner, shooting down five enemy aircraft. Batum even fought the famous Red Baron at one point, and he was highly decorated. In World War II, he rose to the rank of Brigadier General. When he died in Mentone, he was the last remaining World War I ace. Singer-songwriter Pierce Pettis lives in Mentone. His songs have been recorded by Joan Baez, Garth Brooks, and Art Garfunkel. Since the 1990s, he's recorded six albums of his own music. Ronnie and Gail Jones of Mentone were selected as the Alabama Farm Bureau Federation's 1983 Outstanding Young Farm Family in Alabama. Paige Phillips Parnell of Mentone was the 1980 Miss Alabama and was the first runner-up in the 1981 Miss America pageant. Mentone's Mark Herndon was the drummer for the country music supergroup Alabama for 25 years. In the mid-1980s, Sharon Barron created and sold her Gordy dolls. They were a hit all over the nation. Doug Shanklin had a 25-year career as an actor, appearing in such films as Star Trek IV and such television programs as Fantasy Island and Three's Company. And Lindsay Whitaker and Pete Halupka are the owners and operators of Harvest Roots a company specializing in non-alcoholic fermented beverages like kombucha. Their products can be found in more than 60 markets across the South. For almost 100 years, Mentone and the mountain around it have hosted tens of thousands of children at summer camps. The first, Camp Alanita, was begun in about 1923, but lasted only a few years. It was located on the brow near Eagle's Nest. Today, the camps provide employment for dozens of area people. The amount of mail handled by the post office quadruples, and the summer population of Mentone increases by several thousand. Area horse farms provide the mounts each camp needs to make the camp experience special. 
Many local commercial establishments do a booming business. The river sees an influx of canoeists. Many canoe for the first time on the Little River, and sometimes it shows. For many campers, their experiences and memories of camp attendance here form a lifelong association with Mentone. Think of how many children are influenced at an early age and have during their formative years here in Mentone. Current Alabama Governor Kay Ivey attended Camp Skyline when she was a child and then served as a counselor. In recent years, the camps have shown their good citizenship by purchasing two vehicles for the Mentone Police Department. Since being incorporated in 1936, Mentone has been served by a succession of men and women mayors who've always had to seek creative ways to make a town with such a small tax base succeed. Rob Hammond is the current mayor. For a tiny town like Mentone, there are a surprising number of civic organizations. Most are run by volunteers. We have so many organizations that improve the quality of life for everybody here. And without all those organizations and all the volunteer hours that are put in, all the resources that are donated, uh, this town wouldn't be what it is. Sharon Haben is the coordinator of both the Rhododendron Festival in May and the Color Fest in October. Two times a year we have a festival that it runs two days and it's like a party for thousands of people that come through our little town and it takes many, many volunteers before, during and after the festival to make it run well and successful. The first civic organization to be created was the Mentone Area Preservation Association, known by its acronym as MAPA. Founded in the early 1980s by Bruce Bonfleur, Sandra Padgett, Homer and Bernice Crow, and a few others, MAPA is dedicated to the preservation and protection of the heritage, natural environment, and other unique qualities of life in the Mentone area. It serves as the chief sponsor and coordinating body of our two festivals. The Rhododendron Festival was actually begun in 1940. Together, these two events each attract as many as 10,000 visitors to the town and raise thousands of dollars. MAPA then grants funds to other organizations to support dozens of community projects and civic organizations, including Moon Lake Elementary, the Volunteer Fire Department, the Rescue Squad, and construction of sidewalks and the Moon Lake Community Library. In 1982, a single-page newsletter called The Groundhog was established. By the spring of 83, it had become a full-blown monthly newspaper, presenting news of area activities. Its almost 400 back issues have featured stories about local people and our history, coverage of town council meetings, and information that has kept Mentonians informed about what is happening in our community. For almost 40 years, the Groundhog has been managed by a long list of capable editors. After a 25-year absence from Mentone, MAPA co-founder Bruce Bonfleur is back in town. I think everybody wants to keep it, you know, pretty much like it, it is, and that's, it's unique. Um, it's still like no other place that I know of. Um, people are kind of the same, very hospitable. And um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm grateful for people in the organizations like the Grand Hong and MAPA and others um, that have kept it that way. The Little River Arts Council is a regional organization headquartered in Mentone. Its goal is to encourage individual creativity and to broaden community participation, appreciation, and support for the visual, performing, and literary arts in the Mentone area. 
Minton has always been known as something of an artist colony. Today, artists like Lydia Randolph and Scott Thomas are among many accomplished artists working in a variety of mediums to present unique paintings, sculptures, glasswork, and crafts for sale. Over the course of the year, the Arts Council sponsors the Summer Music Series, which presents free concert performances. A fall tour of homes features some of the area's most unique residences. In the last year, literally hundreds of men, women, and children worked together to create this staircase mosaic portrait of the Little River. It's located at DeSoto Falls. The monolithic stones which greet visitors as they approach town were an Arts Council project. And each fall, the Council brings actors to town from the Alabama Shakespeare Festival to perform classic plays for the children who attend Moon Lake School. The Rhododendron Garden Club has been providing educational and informational programs about area plants and trees for many years. It supplies a column to the groundhog each month and conducts roadside cleanups in the downtown area. The Moon Lake Community Library was created by a community-wide fundraising effort and built in the 1990s. It serves as the town's public library and as the library for Moon Lake School. It's become a major meeting place for author talks, quilting circles, a book club, Saturday morning gamers, and meetings of various organizations. It also created many libraries, one at the post office and another at the state park's country store, where anyone can take a book or even leave one for others. Where else is there a town of 400 people with such a library? The aim of the Mentone Educational Resources Foundation, or MRF, is to enrich the learning and living of the community by identifying needs and coordinating resources. It works closely with Moon Lake Elementary to provide tutoring, sponsor field trips for students, and fund a fine arts teacher. In the fall and spring, weekly senior lunches held at the Murph House give attendees a chance to socialize and to eat a good meal provided by local restaurants and other donors. A walking track offers a safe place for folks to get a little exercise. And Murph's annual Taste of Mentone dinner showcases local food from our restaurants and farms and features an art auction to raise funds to sustain Murph's programs. And it guarantees a good time to boot. Minton also has the DeSoto Rescue Squad, fully equipped and manned by a highly trained group of volunteers. Our North Lookout Mountain Fire Protection District is ready and well trained to respond to house fires as well as fighting fires in the woods. Its efforts during the 2017 outbreak of arson started fires in the woods was epic and heroic. One World Adventure provides a range of recreational activities primarily aimed at teaching children the special values of the natural world. Plans are underway to build the Mentone Arts and Cultural Center. This facility will provide a place to present the work of local and regional artists and will promote the area's rich arts heritage. It will include a multi-purpose room with a performance stage and plans include a culinary kitchen, rooms for teaching arts-related classes, a museum, and an outdoor amphitheater. These and other organizations help bring a richer, fuller life to Mentone than it might otherwise have. With the loss of the Mentone Springs Hotel, the Mentone Inn is the last of the hotels still operating in the downtown area. Nippersink Lodge, on the river near the falls, still offers a laid-back atmosphere. Riverdale, now part of Camp Laney, and the Riverside Inn, now part of Camp Skyline, are reminders of an earlier, slower age when relaxing on a veranda was what the Mentone experience was all about. And these days, the town is surrounded by cabin rentals and bed and breakfast inns. Mentone in the modern era is home to a wide diversity of people, and there is a respect for the opinions and aspirations of others. For instance, local and area women come together each year to discuss their needs and the roles women play in modern society. The open and free expression of ideas here is valued. 
Minton is looking forward even as it contemplates its past. Leadership is strong, volunteerism is bountiful, and the future looks bright. It hasn't become Gatlinburg, and people here are just fine with that, thank you very much. The downtown area has a wide range of businesses ranging from eateries and restaurants to specialty shops. In 2018, the town's citizens voted to allow beer and wine sales in Minton by a three to one margin. The tax revenue generated has already had a positive impact on the town's budget. And the town decided in 2019 to sell its water department to the city of Fort Payne. With some of the funds from this sale, the town council has purchased the old Kamama building to use as a town hall, visitors welcome center, and venue for meetings and events. Mentone's natural beauty and mild climate have attracted people for more than 150 years. And when you ask folks here what they value most about the town, a couple of things keep emerging. It's a natural wonder and people are all wonderful together. It's a great community. I love not having traffic. I love not having stoplights. I love not having McDonald's. Um, I love that when I go to the store, I'm going to have to say hi to somebody. Probably going to have to talk for five minutes too, right? And that's great. But to me, Mentone's quality is the people. It seems to attract people that are just okay people. I feel like I benefited from growing up in a small town where everybody knew everybody and never was welcome everywhere. I just feel like uh, I'm just a country boy. <laughs> One time I quoted, I made a quote that it was like a magnet for creativity, which is true. There are so many artists here. And to me, the best thing about Mento is the people. That is absolutely, it's the diversity of people. I said it one time, I said, I feel fortunate to live in a community where a generous spirit prevails. And long may it be so, in this special mountaintop where Little River runs. It's a mountaintop where little river 